a very good evening to one and all. And I, on behalf of the organizing committee of this sixth lecture workshop, which has been conducted in online mode on the transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by Shanti Swarupatnagar awardees, I welcome all of you. And uh, the organizing committee, it comprises of the uh, president of the NASI, that's the National Academy of Sciences India, Professor Achoy Khatak, the chairperson, NASI Delhi chapter, Professor Anurag Sharma, the principal of the institute, Professor Im Chan Chan, the India Lopadhyaya College, myself, and my two other co panelists, uh, Dr. Poonam Kasturi, who is the co convener of this workshop, and Dr. Ketika. Apart from all the members of the DBT Star College Committee, uh, under the ages of whom which we are organizing this particular lecture workshop. So the program for this lecture workshop, starting from today, the first speaker for today is Dr. Kairat Saikrishnan, who is from the biology division of the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Pune. And he'll be talking to us on a very interesting topic, our DNA cutting and shredding and how bacteria prevent the phage attacks. And I really would like to thank uh, Dr. Sai Krishnan because he's traveling right now. And I think he has stopped his car somewhere on, on road towards uh, moving towards the airport. And he has a flight to catch around nine o'clock. So that shows the commitment of the resource person. And we should be really thankful to all such people who have been there with us uh, in past and this particular workshop and future also for the benefit of humanity and promotion of science. So Dr. Kairath is a professor at uh, ISER Pune, and he did his BSc in physics at the University College Thiruvananthapuram, followed by an integrated PhD in biological sciences from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He carried out his postdoctoral research work at the Clare Hall Laboratories, Cancer Research UK, and was a visiting scientist at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge. In terms of awards and fellowships, he is a recipient of the CSIR Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Prize in the year 2019 and DBT India S. Ramachandran National Bioscience Award 2019 and also the Welcome Trust DBT India Intermediate Fellowship during the year 2010 to 15 and the EMBO Long Term Fellowship Award during the year 2006 to 2008. So without wasting much time, I now would like to invite Dr. Sai Krishnan to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk. Uh, maybe you can unmute yeah, yourself, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation, Professor sure. Saxena. And it's a privilege to uh, discuss my work uh, with uh, an audience that's so keen on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the topic of science in general, because I understand the program covers a large breadth of various uh, fields of science and uh, it's uh, a privilege to talk uh, uh, in this particular meeting and as uh, professor saxena mentioned uh, my uh, work deals with understanding a particular machinery that is present in bacterial cell which prevents uh, phages which are nothing but viruses that attack bacteria from attacking them or infecting them and this is done from what has come out from our study by two methods, DNA cutting and shredding. And uh, I will like to show how uh, this work that we are carrying out is uh, performed and the results that we have obtained so far. So here is a picture of a bacterial cell. Uh, this is an electron micrograph of a bacterial cell which is now infected with the viral particles. You can see them here. And the viral particles, as I said, are called bacteriophages. And uh, what they do is they adhere to the bacterial cell and after a while, not a very long time, but in a very short while, you can see the cell literally uh, succumbs to the attack. And you can see many particles of uh, the phages being produced and these are coming out of the bacterial cell. It's no more present, it's lysed. The cell is lysed and what you see are the particles released which will go and infect the neighboring cells. And that's how the bacterial uh, viruses, the bacteriophages attack a bacterial cell and uh, then uh, basically eliminates the entire colony. The cells that make a colony of bacteria 
and uh, thus they are a potent uh, potent uh, enemy for this bacterial cells now uh, the bacteria bacterial systems are also pretty smart the cell here is a schematic of a bacterial cell and you can see here a representation of the various machinery that are available within the bacterial cell to prevent just this attack, the attack of bacteriophages. A bacteriophage, what it does is when it adheres to the bacterial cell, it, like an injection, like a syringe, injects its genomic DNA into the bacteria. So this long thread-like thing that you see is a schematic of the genomic DNA being injected into the bacterial cell. And what the bacteria has to do is to degrade this genomic DNA. If it fails to degrade the genomic DNA, the genomic DNA of the phage will replicate and many particles of the phages will be produced within the bacterial cell and they will lice open the cell and they will then attack the neighboring cell. So that's the life cycle of a bacteriophage. And the aim of a bacterial cell is to somehow prevent the DNA from uh, replicating and making more phage particles. So basically the simplest way to do it is degrade the genomic DNA, which contains the information for formation of these phage particles. Now, uh, one of these systems, the first such system to be discovered was uh, called the restriction modification system, which is shown here as RM system. And now people uh, often recognize this as the bacteria cells innate immune, immune system. And uh, in uh, correspondence, there is an adaptive immune system of bacteria, which is called the CRISPR-Cas system. And uh, CRISPR-Cas system came to forefront over the last decade, and they have provided a revolution uh, in the area of genome engineering. A similar re revolution happened in the 60s and 70s when res restriction modification systems were discovered. And they revolutionized what is called uh, as genetic recombination technology, which allowed uh, genes to be stitched into uh, vectors which could then be propagated in bacterial cells and made in large numbers. That provided uh, our first handle into genetic engineering. Now, uh, uh, what, uh, as I mentioned, the restriction modification does is as follows. Whenever a phage sticks to a bacterial cell, it would inject the DNA. The DNA is cut by the restrictions component. And there is another component, the modification component, which modifies the host genomic DNA. It methylates the host genomic DNA. Now, uh, the modification happens at, the, at a particular target site, a particular sequence on the DNA. That particular sequence is the sequence that the restriction component prefers to cut. So the sequence, if it is unmodified, is cut by the restriction system. And if it is modified, it gets protected from the restriction enzyme. Consequently, the host genomic DNA is protected while the foreign DNA, which is unmodified, gets cut. So this is the two component restriction modification system often seen in bacteria. And uh, the role of uh, a restriction system is not just limited to cutting uh, phage DNA. They can also cut any foreign DNA, including uh, DNA that ca carry information for making a bacterial cell antibiotic resistant. So there are a large number of uh, foreign DNA uh, in the environment that can be acquired by a bacterial cell, which would make the bacterial cell uh, resistant to antibiotics. And that's the antimicrobial resistance problem that we are facing right now, which is as big a problem as the COVID pandemic that we are facing right now. So it's a more long-term problem as well, which is, unknown, uh, uh, unseen as uh, its, its effects are unfelt, unlike uh, the COVID pandemic. And consequently, it is a problem that does not seem to uh, be attacked as much or as uh, powerfully as we have been trying to eliminate the problem of COVID. So uh, this particular enzyme, SOUS1, is a restriction enzyme. Uh, it was found that if you uh, have a Staphylococcus aureus strain, the MRSA strain, if uh, this particular strain does not have SOUS1, it becomes vancomycin resistant. Those strains that have SOUS1, which is a restriction enzyme, are, re uh, are resistant to vancomycin, are no longer resistant to vancomycin, and uh, they succumb to vancomycin treatment. But those which do not have SOUS1 become resistant to vancomycin. 
So this was one of the first examples uh, just a decade back when it was shown that the restriction modif modification system can play a bigger role when it comes to a bacterial uh, system. And uh, what was also interesting is that the saw US1 system, the restriction enzyme here was ATP dependent, which means it required nucleotide, which is the energy currency in a cell for its activity. Now, this is uh, something that may be surprising to many of you because uh, most of the restriction enzymes that are known or studied well, very well or are, uh, show, are uh, present in textbooks are those that are nucleotide independent. They do not require energy currency. They just require divalent cations such as magnesium for carrying out the catalysis, for carrying out the enzymatic reaction, which is breaking the phosphodiester bond of the double-stranded DNA. Now, uh, surprisingly, there are enzymes uh, as you can see, the list of this are given here. These are the different classifications of this enzyme. All these enzymes require nucleotide, which means they consume the energy currency of the cell. And if you look at the number of such enzymes in nature, the uh, representation of nucleotide dependent restriction enzyme is as many as that of the nucleotide independent system, which means that nature prefers to have this nucleotide dependent system despite them being energetically ex expensive. So this is one question that has been uh, uh, one of the driving motivations for understanding why these enzymes are present in nature and how do they work. The other reason why we study this restriction enzyme system is because they are very complex. Uh, these enzyme systems have multiple domains, each of which carry out different uh, enzymatic activities. So each of these domains have their own enzymatic activity. And uh, what one sees is a net effect of this various enzymatic activities working together in concert, this, uh, performing one particular task. So they, look as, uh, they resemble what we generally call as molecular machines. And that's one of the other questions that we ask in our laboratory. What is the mechanism of protein machines? How do they function? How do they carry out the, the work? How do uh, different domains communicate with each other? So these are the different questions that we ask in, the lab, uh, in our laboratory. And the model system that we use are this nucleotide dependent restriction modification enzymes. Or they could be just nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes. Now, uh, before I go into uh, details of nucleotide dependent restriction enzyme, let me just uh, briefly introduce to introduce you to what nucleotide independent restriction enzymes do. And it is it, it might be true that many of you would have used these uh, enzymes in the laboratory to cut DNA or would have studied about them in the textbooks. So uh, here is a double-stranded DNA. And if there is a particular target sequence which the restriction enzyme recognizes, the restriction enzyme will bind to the target sequence on the DNA, and it would cut either close to the target site or on the target site. And this entire reaction is nucleotide independent. You just require, uh, uh, the, as I said, a divalent cation like magnesium. And a lot of our understanding of how these enzymes work uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, facilitated by uh, a technique called X-ray crystallography, a technique which allows you to determine uh, the crystal structure of the enzyme which is carrying out the reaction in atomic detail. So here is a picture or a, a crystal, a picture of the crystal structure of a restriction enzyme, which is a very famous restriction enzyme called ECOR1. This is a nucleotide independent restriction enzyme, and you can see that it is performing uh, the cutting of the DNA. The DNA is this helical structure that you see here. And you see that there is a break here. And this break is a result of the catalytic reaction that has been carried out by the two subunits of ECOR1. ECOR1 is made up of two identical subunits of this uh, uh, protein uh, uh, monomers. And each of them perform the catalysis. And consequently, what you get is a double strand DNA break. By performing two catalysis, by these two independent uh, domains, which come together to form the dimer, this uh, enzyme is able to cut a double-stranded DNA, which has two phosphodiester backbones running. And consequently, you get a double-strand DNA. Now, how does a nucleotide-dependent restriction enzyme cut DNA? Uh, 
well uh, a nucleotide dependent restriction enzyme uh, is much more complex many of these enzymes also have something called a modification component which i as i mentioned prevents uh, the host genome from getting cut by the restriction enzyme now when you have the, such an enzyme uh, and if you have a double stranded dna with two such target sites uh, the enzyme would uh, recognize the target sites and in the presence of a, a, a cofactor called s adenosyl methionine the enzyme will methylate the target site and uh, you get a methylation of the target sequence and the enzyme would lose its affinity for the target sequence and it will fall off the dna so nothing else will happen so this is how the protection of the dna happens methylation reduces the affinity of the enzyme for the dna but the same enzyme in the presence of atp instead of uh, acid adenosyl methionine would result in a cut on of the dna in between the two target sites or close to one of the two target sites so this is how what the reactions are so depending on what is the kind of enzyme that one is looking at say type 1 and type 1 sp uh, nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes would cut the dna somewhere in between the two target sites while type 3 and uh, an, uh, an enzyme called mcrbc which is gtp dependent would cut close to one of the two target sites consequently you have dna cleavage happening you have a double strand dna break now people have been trying to understand how this enzymes uh, cut dna what is their uh, reaction mechanism and uh, uh, there have been extensive studies from groups around the world trying to dissect out this process uh, people have been using techniques of uh, biochemistry uh, state of the art biotech biochemical techniques state of the art single molecule biophysical techniques to address this questions and people have also been trying to obtain the crystal structure of this enzymes uh, just like uh, the crystal structure of eco r1 i showed you helps us understand how cleavage happens dna cleavage happens people have been trying to uh, obtain the crystal structure of this nucleotide dependent restriction modification enzymes and there have been many such efforts over the years but it has not been an easy work because this enzymes are much are bigger in size and they have multiple domains so what people have achieved uh, uh, till say 2012 was a structure of uh, some parts of this enzyme either the domains or the subunits but not of the entire enzyme itself uh, it was uh, around this time that i started my uh, independent uh, research group at isa pune and i chose uh, the restriction modification enzyme as a model system as i said to understand how this enzymes work and in uh, 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 as a bigger goal towards understanding how protein machines work uh, and uh, towards this i started by trying to determine the crystal structure and as a uh, step towards this i identified a few model systems that would i felt be amenable for crystallographic studies one of this enzyme system was called the type 1 sp restriction modification enzyme uh, there are two examples that we worked in the laboratory which have now become prototypes the lalg1 and lalb3 system uh, for example lalb3 is a single polypeptide chain which is made up of the nucleus domain the motor domain which uh, hydrolyzes atp the methyl transferase domain which methylates the uh, dna at a particular target sequence and the target recognition domain which recognizes the target sequence you can see that this protein is going to be very big it is indeed a big protein which is 180 kilo dalton in size and you can see this is the target sequence that the uh, enzyme recognizes it recognizes the target site uh, tnagcc and the adenine that it methylates it's an uh, the uh, modification component which is the methyl transferase is an n6 adenine adenine methyl transferase it methylates this particular adenine shown here and uh, once this uh, adenine is methylated at the n6 position the enzyme would lose its affinity for this target sequence and it would not it would no longer bind to the dna if this target sequence is not methylated and if you have two such target sites pointing head to head in the head to head orientation you get cleavage somewhere in between the two target sites and this orientation as you can see is fixed 
by the sequence. The sequence here is asymmetric and consequently one can imagine that it has a tail and a head. And uh, the orientation of the target sequence, the two target sequence have to be head to head for cleavage to happen. There's something very interesting because uh, uh, if you uh, think about uh, uh, DNA in a bacterial cell, when it undergoes uh, replication, uh, I mentioned that the DNA is protected from the cleavage activity because it is methylated. Now, when replication happens, the enzyme loses uh, the methylation status. It undergoes a change. It would happen such that the daughter strand will not have the methylation imprint uh, because of the modification component, which will methylate the uh, adenine here. So it would be unmethylated. However, the mother strand will maintain the methylation status. And uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, DNA sequences, which are in a particular orientation, will remain methylated, while those which are in the opposite orientation will become unmethylated. And the requirement that the two target site ha sites have to be head to head ensures that this kind of sequences will not be cut by uh, lab E1, lab E3 or lab a large E1, because these guys are no, no more a substrate. Because what you require for cleavage to happen is two unmethylated DNA facing uh, each other in the head to head orientation. And that's the beauty of uh, this particular orientation requirement, which makes also uh, an interesting example of how nature uh, is, uh, ensures uh, things work properly in a very smart way. So uh, uh, as I said, I used uh, X-ray crystallography as a tool for determining the structure of this enzyme. Uh, and what we did in the laboratory was to try and crystallize this protein and uh, to understand the mechanism of how this enzyme works, we felt it is important to have the uh, structure of the enzyme with its substrate bound. Consequently, we uh, crystallize the enzyme with the substrate. In this case, it is a DNA with one particular one target sequence, which is shown here again. And we crystallize this particular uh, enzyme with the DNA target sequence. And uh, the crystal structure uh, was solved to a resolution of 2.7 angstrom. And you can see the uh, structure here of the 180 kilo Dalton protein made up of different domains. Uh, you see the nucleus domain located at the end terminus of the protein. And you also see uh, the enzyme, uh, uh, the motor domain, which is made up of two uh, subdomains called the Riquet fold domains, which together make the ATPase. And uh, the ATP, which is hydrolyzed by this particular motor, is uh, bound over here in between the two subdomains. And the motor domain is then connected to the methyl transferase, which is or in orange, by a coupler domain, which possibly transduces the energy released upon hydrolysis of ATP to the domains over here, the methyl transferase and the target recognition domain, which together recognize the target sequence of the DNA here. Now you can you may see here uh, that there is some uh, distortion of the double stranded DNA. Uh, the thing that you see clearly is that the base located in the target sequence is flipped out. It is out of the helical uh, structure, and this particular adenine is actually the adenine that gets methylated. So what we have here is a snapshot of the enzyme uh, trying to methylate the DNA. And uh, by uh, flipping out, the process is called flipping out of the adenine base into the active site of the methyl transferase. Now, uh, this particular structure provided us with a lot of uh, insights into the uh, working of this enzyme. It showed us the uh, architecture of the motor domain and where the ATP would bind. And uh, this allowed us to, this led us to ask the question, what is the role of the motor domain in this particular enzyme? To address that particular question, uh, we carried out an uh, 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 we carried out an assay, this displacement assay. Now, uh, the motors that uh, I showed you uh, over there, the ATPS motor that I showed you here, are generally uh, motors that run along the DNA. So such motors are seen in uh, other enzymes such as uh, chromatin remodelers, which allows the 
chromatin remodeler to move along a double strand DNA. So we ask the question whether the motor uh, propels the movement of this particular enzyme along the DNA. To address that question, what we did is we took a double strand DNA with the target sequence and we placed a, a, a fluorescently labeled single strand which would form a triplex DNA. So while we know that uh, DNA, uh, if you have two strands of DNA, they, they, and they, if their sequences are complementary, they form a duplex DNA as shown here. If you have a third DNA strand, which has a appropriately made sequence, it can form a triplex DNA. So you have three strands of DNA form coming together here. And this triplex DNA acts as a roadblock for enzymes that move along the DNA. And if the uh, movement is uh, powered by uh, the energy currency ATP, it would be able to push out this uh, particular single strand, the triplex strand. And uh, consequently, you will end up with a duplex back into uh, the, or you will end up with the original duplex. And this particular single strand, which is fluorescently labeled, will be lost. It will not no longer be bound to the DNA. And this can be uh, observed using fluorescence because this particular uh, single strand is fluorescently labeled. And this is what we showed when we uh, did this particular assay. We showed that these enzymes uh, run along the DNA in a directional manner. And whenever they encounter a triplex, this uh, uh, fluorescently labeled DNA is pushed out and which can be then monitored by fluorescence as an increase in fluorescence intensity. And uh, what we also showed was that if you change the orientation of the target sequence, uh, you would see that these enzymes would move in this direction now. They would never move in this opposite direction, which means that the direction is always fixed. For a given enzyme, the direction is fixed and they move forward in an energy dependent manner. So it's an active translocation. And that's the word that we use, active translocation for such movements. Now, what it means is that this enzyme in the presence of ATP is running along the DNA. Now, previously it was proposed by a group in UK that if you have uh, the DNA with uh, the two target site and the enzyme, the hydrolysis of ATP would uh, drive the movement of the enzyme. But since it is stuck to the target sequence, it will not move along the DNA. Rather, rather it, it would loop out the DNA. And this looping out of the DNA would bring two such enzymes, which are placed on two target sites facing each other, close to one another. And this will bring the nucleases of the enzyme to carry out catalysis of the phosphodiester breakage. And you would get DNA, double strand DNA break. And that's the picture that is shown here. Now, uh, 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 this uh, uh, was fine, but there is a conundrum that our structure brought in. The structure that we determined showed that the enzyme is bound such that the target recognition domain and the methyl transferase domain bind to the target sequence, uh, while the nucleus domain is located upstream of the target sequence, not downstream. Consequently, the cleavage of the DNA will happen upstream and not downstream. While uh, this model required that the cleavage hap uh, uh, would happen downstream, which is what we know, the cleavage happens downstream. But if this enzyme in this particular orientation has to cleave the DNA downstream, which is in this direction, then either this enzyme has to undergo a large conformational change such that the nucleus will uh, then be able to reach this part of the DNA, which looked a bit uh, less possible. Or the other possibility is that the enzyme would move along the DNA like a, a rail engine would run on a rail track. And this is the model that, uh, or the hypothetical model that we had for the enzyme moving along the DNA for cutting the uh, DNA in between the two target sites resulting from the two nucleases coming close to one another. Now to prove uh, this, we use something called a magnetic tweezers assay. This was an assay that we carried out in collaboration with a group in University of Bristol, where what we did is uh, we took the, a piece of DNA uh, and uh, had a magnetic bead attached to one end. 
and the DNA was held on the floor uh, and a glass uh, slide. And the bead was then suspended using a magnetic, uh, uh, using a magnet, uh, like a tweezer would pull the bead up. The magnets pulled the magnetic beads up. Consequently, you had the DNA stretching straight. And based on the amount of force or the movement of the uh, bar magnets, you could apply a force on the bead and uh, there would be a tension uh, related to the DNA. And this can then be measured. And uh, in terms of distance of the bead with respect to a, uh, either a microscope, a, a eye or a microscope, which can view the bead. And then if you had an enzyme which was looping the DNA, it would pull the bead down. And this would result in the distance between the bead and the floor to reduce, which can be then, uh, as I said, monitored using a microscope. And this was, uh, this is a picture of an enzyme that actually lo loops the DNA. And when you add this enzyme with ATP, it actually pulls the bead down, which can be monitored. Now we ask the question, does uh, LABI3, which is the enzyme that I was talking to you about, do the same thing or not? And to do that, what we did was we took the same system apparatus, the magnetic tweezers as a apparatus, with a DNA with the beads. And now we change the target sequence to the, those of the LABI3 target sequence, and then added the enzyme and ATP. But we did not see change in position of the bead. The bead remained where it was. It, it was not pulled down. Now, of course, one can uh, say the argue that uh, possibly the enzyme is not active. It is not hydrolyzing ATP, and consequently, it is not pulling the bead down. Now, to show that uh, the enzyme was active and the hydrolysis of ATP was happening, what we did was we introduced two target sites, such that if you had added the enzyme, it would uh, run, uh, it would cut the DNA, which was the activity that the enzyme performs when ATP is added. If you have two target sites facing head to head, it would cut the DNA. If it cuts the DNA, then the bead would be lost from the field of vision and it would not be visible anymore. And this is what we noticed when we added ATP to the system. You saw that the position of the bead did not change, but over time, it we could not view the bead anymore. It was lost. So it is something like a helium balloon, which is tied down by a string to, uh, to a surface or a, to, uh, to a pillar. And then you cut the thread and the helium balloon would float away from sight. And that's what happens uh, here, where the bead is lost from sight. And uh, that proved that these enzymes were not pulling the DNA, but rather moving along the DNA like a rail engine would do on a rail track. And this resulted in the two enzymes coming close to one another, like this, and bringing the two nucleases together. So our model for how these enzymes cleave the DNA was basically, you have the enzyme, when you add them to the double-stranded DNA, they would bind to the target site. And in the presence of ATP, they would come together. And each of this would make a, a break a phosphodiester bond when they come together or converge. And this would result in two NICs on each of the strands. And when if the NICs are close enough, you would get a double-strand DNA break. But what we noticed is that the spacing between the two NICs in this simple-minded picture of two enzymes which have converged was about 75 basis base pair separation. And this is not something that is going to destabilize the double-strand DNA because you all know that uh, uh, double-strand DNA is stabilized by hydrogen bonds that exist between the base pairs. So if the NICs are separated by 75 base pairs, you're not going to get a uh, destabilization of double strand DNA. So then what is happening here? To uh, understand that we did a complicated experiment where we actually uh, looked at all the broken ends of uh, double strand DNA that are uh, catalyzed by uh, LABI3 and checked what was the overhang that was produced. And we found that it, the overhangs or the separation between the two NICs, which would result in overhangs, was not 75 base pair, but it was, had a low value of 30 base pairs. And that over time, this position of the NICs changed. And you could see that the, uh, uh, the location of the NICs increased. So here is a picture of uh, double strand DNA, if, uh, a schematic picture of 
a double strand unit where each of this line represents a strand and the line that connects the two are the positions of the nicks that we measure by sequencing which is the method that we use to locate where this cleavage happens and we found that this position varied over time and this resulted in uh, us uh, realizing that these enzymes are not just making one single nick but are dynamic on the double stranded dna making multiple nicks and this is what the picture then we uh, have in mind that of the enzyme which have come converged together uh, which have converged because atp was used for hydrolysis hydrolysis and pushing the two enzymes together to converge and once they converge they make the nicks and the enzymes which are still having the motor domain and atp in uh, would start uh, moving back and forth because the motor is still active and every time they stop or stall they would uh, make nicks and if you have two nicks which are close to one another you will have a double strand dna break, as shown here so as a consequence what you have is multiple nicks on the double stranded dna between the two target sites and you get dna cleavage and this is what the picture that we have as a consequence of the enzyme acting on the double stranded dna there is nicks happening between the target sites and there is double strand dna break. and this uh, is a, a work that was carried out by three students in my laboratory uh, mahesh chan manasi kulkarni and neha devan and uh, the work has been published in a series of uh, research articles, which uh, you may find interesting to read if you're interested in this, uh, getting more details of how this enzyme system works. Now, uh, I mentioned about SAW-US1, which is the enzyme that prevents uh, Staphylococcus for uh, RES from becoming uh, vancomycin resistant. And I told you that uh, saw us one is an ATP dependent restriction enzyme, which cuts the DNA. Now, uh, what is interesting is that in saw us one, there are many restriction enzymes, but only one uh, of these enzymes that is saw us one, when it is inactivated makes the uh, bacteria resistant to vancomycin, which means that it is uh, saw us one, which has the ability or is a potent endonuclease or a nucleus that prevents any foreign DNA coming in from getting uh, or uh, preventing their entry into the bacterial cell. Uh, of course, it doesn't prevent all foreign DNA, but only those foreign DNA whose target sequences are, uh, or whose DNA have the target sequences that SOUS1 recognizes. And the target sequence that SOUS1 recognizes is CMCTGG. So uh, it's interesting a system because what you see here is an enzyme which recognizes a modified or a methylated DNA rather than a non-methylated DNA. I've been talking about restriction enzymes as those systems which recognize unmodified DNA. But uh, then uh, the interaction between a bacteria and the phage, the virus that uh, attacks the bacteria, is a constant arms race. If uh, phages infect the bacteria and inject their DNA and lies, open, lies the bacterial cell, the bacterial cell in turn uh, have this defense machinery that cut the foreign DNA, the unmodified phage DNA from replicating because they degrade them. As a consequence, what uh, the phages have, certain phages have evolved are methylated DNA, methylated genomic DNA that evades the restriction modification system, the restriction modification system, which cut unmodified DNA. But uh, now the bacterial cell has a enzyme defense machinery that would preferentially cut those modified DNA, which are not recognized by the uh, conventional restriction modification system, which only uh, cut unmodified DNA. So this is a product of the evolutionary arms race between the bacteria and its, uh, 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 its uh, enemy the phage here and uh, consequently you have saw us1 which cuts for uh, modified dna and what's interesting is that uh, saw us1 uh, cuts the dna such that it it literally shreds the dna into small pieces so what i've shown here is a comparison between an ntp or a nucleotide dependent restriction enzyme and a nucleotide independent restriction enzyme uh, BSTN1 is a nucleotide independent restriction enzyme, the restriction enzyme that does not require any energy currency. 
And these are the kind of enzymes that we use in the laboratory for cutting DNA at specific target sites. And BSTN1 cuts at a specific target site, which is the same target sequence as SOUS1. And when it cuts, you get these three distinct bands. But uh, when you add SOUS1, and if you have at least two target sites, it would cut the DNA, but the pattern you see is totally different from the pattern that is generated with, by BSTN1. And that pattern you see result is most distinct in the region between the two target sites. You can see that the DNA here, unlike the DNA here, which is crisp band, is literally broken into multiple pieces. And that's why it doesn't give a distinct band, rather you get a smear, and uh, which indicates that this region of the DNA is broken into multiple pieces. And this is what uh, is the mechanism that I showed you earlier, where the in between the two target sites, you have multiple breaks causing double strand DNA shredding. So we call this process of DNA being broken into multiple bands as shredding of double strand DNA. And uh, this is a phenomenon that has been discovered in my laboratory. And uh, what is the benefit of uh, such a system? Well, uh, we know that shredded DNA, if the damage to a double strand DNA is so enormous, like the shredding of DNA in multiple position, repair of such double strand DNA is very difficult. If you have a restriction enzyme which cuts at a particular site, it can be repaired back easily by an enzyme called ligase. And this is what we do in the laboratory. We cut the uh, DNA with uh, an ATP independent enzyme at a particular site, and then stitch it back using the enzyme ligase. But a, a sequence that's broken so badly is very difficult to repair. We also hypothesize that the pieces of the single strand DNA that are produced because of this DNA shredding can be taken up by systems such as Cas1, Cas2, which would uh, acquire this uh, single strand DNA and serve as memories of phage attacks. So what we show, uh, what we propose here is a synergy between the innate uh, restriction modifying enzyme machinery and the adaptive bacterial cell, which is something that we are working towards proving. And finally, I would like to uh, conclude this talk uh, by Finally, I'd like to conclude this talk by uh, saying that uh, uh, DNA cleavage or cu cutting of DNA has been known by two processes, endonuclease activity and exonuclease activity. Endonuclease activity is when an uh, enzyme would cut the DNA somewhere in between the DNA, not from the ends. While exonuclease activity is an activity where the DNA is cut from the end. It often happens that one of the two strands are cut from one of the ends and you get DNA being cleaved. What we have discovered is a third mode of DNA cleavage, which we call DNA shredding. And this results in DNA being broken at multiple position between the two target sites. And this is the work that uh, the different uh, uh, publications that we've got uh, showing or demonstrating the activity of DNA shredding. and. Uh, uh, I uh, invite uh, those who are interested in more details to please go through this work. And with that, I'd like to end my talk by acknowledging uh, the people who have been carrying out this work. They're primarily my students, present and past students, uh, my collaborators uh, on uh, cryo-EM studies, which I did not talk about, and single molecule studies, which I talked about. That's Mark Shelkan from the University of Bristol and the synchrotron facilities without which these crystal structures could not have been determined. I specifically thank DBT India and DST India for facilitating many of this access to these facilities. And I thank SERP for funding the research work and I serve Pune for the support, including infrastructure support. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sadhgrishnan, for elucidating such a complex topic in such a simpler manner. And there are certain questions in the chat. Uh, would you like to just have a glance at them? And, sure, I would like to. I will yeah. stop the share. Yes, yes. Yeah, because then it will be easy. Yeah. Yes. Whichever one you would like to take, I know it's around 6.45. You must have been parked it for about 45 minutes now. So whichever two, yeah. three questions you would like to take up. Sure.
So uh, one of the question, the question from Akshat Gupta is, is there a single cut or are there multiple cuts between two target sequences using nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes? So uh, Akshat, uh, there are certain nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes, the ones that I showed you, LABI3, SOUS1 and so on, uh, they seem to cut or they cut the DNA at multiple points between two target sites. So that way there are multiple NICs or multiple phosphodiester bond breakages happening. And that's our observation. But this is not necessarily true with all nucleotide dependent restriction enzymes, because we know that there are restriction enzymes such as type three uh, restriction modification enzymes, which also use nucleotide. They are ATP dependent in general. They don't cut, uh, they don't shred the DNA. They cut at specific point, but uh, at a fixed distance from the target sequence. So that is a specific cut. So that those are going to be only two phosphodiester bond breakages, which results in double strand DNA. So the, there is a question about uh, from Amisha uh, about why DNA should be cut. Uh, just to re reiterate, the DNA, in this case, the FATCH DNA has to be cut to prevent it from replicating and making multiple copies of the protein that would then form the phages. So it is a way to prevent the, uh, it is a way to prevent phages being formed within the bacterial cell. And phages are nothing but the viruses. So it's, uh, it's to prevent viral infection from occurring. So uh, there, there's a question of uh, significance of uh, microbes in terms of virulence and pathogenicity in humans. Uh, I don't know if uh, the question is, again, from Akshata, is it, if it is about uh, the phages or the bacteria. Phages, as far as we understand, do not affect uh, human cells. And uh, they have consequently been in the past and now have revived, uh, have been again revived uh, as a possible therapy against the bacterial pathogens. So this is called the phage therapy. And this is something that has uh, received a lot of interest in recent years, especially because of antibiotic resistance coming into work. Yeah, are there any more questions you would like to take? Oh, I, so there are, there's a question on how non-living materials are different from living materials. There are a whole set of uh, parameters that can be used to define or uh, distinguish between living and non-living. Some of them, of course, is uh, they have to replicate and uh, they undergo cell division, for example, uh, they can multiply. Uh, if you go to higher order living, they can, uh, they through the process of sex, can propagate uh, or have progenies. And there are many such uh, parameters that can uh, distinguish between a non living and a living material. So there's a question on uh, from Adir Raj about uh, possibility of using viruses to overcome antibiotic resistance. Yes, fast, as I mentioned, fast therapy is something that has been right now looked at very seriously as an alternate method to overcome uh, pathogens. So, uh, so they are going to serve, uh, they, uh, there are efforts to use them as, uh, uh, as a system to kill pathogens instead of using antibiotics. So there is a question from Yash Yadav about what is the significance of palindrome sites in DNA. I did not talk about palindromic sequences here because the sequences that the enzymes that I talked about are uh, asymmetric. They do not form palindromes. Palindromes are sequences which uh, have uh, would not have a head and a tail. They would be uh, symmetrical. They will essentially, if you can think, if you want to use uh, in a analogy, it would be having a two-fold symmetry. And uh, such sequences uh, uh, can uh, uh, help a dimer of a nucleus to cut, bind to the DNA sequence. It also can form secondary structures such as stem loops and so on. Uh, 
with that, uh, I think uh, these are the uh, questions that have been asked in the chat box. Was it successful? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kairat and all the attendees for such an uh, uh, interactive session, which Dr. Kairat has made, taking up all possible questions by the students. And I would like to apprise that uh, there may be some undergraduate students or postgrad or research scholar or faculty members because it's a diverse audience. Yes. And it's like, uh, it's like a walk-in and you can listen to it. And the reason why I am seeking the permission to record it, because some of them, they are not able to attend that thing. So at times they usually ask for it. So I'll be taking, uh, there are a lot of personal chats I can see that can we get a recording of this? So I've told them that it's only with the permission of the speaker that if it is allowed, then we can share. Otherwise, it's all the more important to listen to the 45-minute session which Dr. Kairat has made. So on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences, India Daily Chapter and the organizing committee, I would like to thank you once again, Dr. Kairat, for sparing your valuable time with us. Any, any concluding you. remarks from your side or your words of wisdom to encourage the students to take up science as a career will be at least in that part, yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, the questions here, for example, is uh, as a, is an indication of how students are keen to know about different things that are, uh, there are uh, things that are old in science, there are things that are new in science, there are uh, new discoveries made in old science and new discoveries made in new science. So it's always an exciting uh, area. Uh, one assumes that we know a lot about nature, how it works, but that's not really true. I think we are still scratching the surface and there's a lot to be learned. And these are things that uh, would also be of technological importance subsequently, because what we are finding is the fundamental basis of things, how, of how things happen. And that leads us to think about how they can be used by us for technology, as technology and tools. And that I think is something that uh, is a, a diff, a, another aspect of what we do. And I think uh, together science and technology is what I think drives uh, uh, the, uh, the growth that humankind has seen over the years. I mean, our standard, the way of our lifestyle, the standard of living has changed so much for the better, I believe. And that I think is driven primarily by science and technology. And I think it would be great to have students take up career in science and technology. And uh, I think uh, keep this uh, process going forward. And I, I, I'm sure we all have seen the exponential growth in technology, but we also require exponential growth in our understanding of how nature works. And that's through science. And that's what I would like you to uh, consider and uh, would like you to think about taking up science as a career. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, all the attendees. And we'll be joining us for the next session, which is scheduled for January 5th, same time at 6 p.m. Thank you very much, Dr. Kairat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.